other um, numbers that have come out of the Fukushima disaster was the excess deaths reported by the CDC in the first 14 weeks after the disaster and then through December of 2011. But we haven't had any updates from the CDC since. At least I have not been able to get any current information. We know that there were 40,000 excess deaths from April to December of 1986 following the Chernobyl disaster. But because there are no post-mortem studies done on people who die of sudden heart attacks and things of that nature to look for radioactive contamination or nuclear fallout as the cause, the excess mortality figures are what are used to judge how it's affected populations. And I, I have a difficult time sometimes explaining that to people. Could you explain more about that? Well, first of all, government nuclear government agencies, politicians, corporations, the military all have a very, very large vested interest in hiding all of this information from the public. At the CDC, you can actually go on their website and um, vital statistics, in other words, births, deaths, diseases, things like that, are reported every week by every county in the United States to the Centers for Disease Control. And they compile the data uh, and uh, release some of it to the public. The raw numbers are there, but they're just piles of numbers. So it really takes an epidemiologist with very specialized and very sophisticated computer software to crunch those numbers and make uh, meaningful estimates and, and reports. Now, there was an epidemiologist. Nobody knows his real name. It would, would have been very dangerous for him to reveal his identity. But he did crunch those numbers until September or October of 2011. And, um, no, actually, he issued some... Uh, a lot of data, maps and stuff, and, and very, very good, very interesting analyses. I'll send it to you. It's a PDF. And um, he was able to say uh, very reliably, and remember, he's a professional epidemiologist with the right software and computers and data, and he said that 100,000 Americans had died by December of 2011 from Fukushima. And the way he determined that was to look at the death rate by region and by cities in the United States going back at least four years before, or maybe even ten years before the Fukushima disaster happened, and then comparing the death rate after that date. And uh, so when you look at all of the deaths, all of the births, um, and you're not looking at specific diseases, it's a much better way to analyze what, what is happening. So what you look for are changes, and changes that have no explanation. So when you look at a long history, like five years or ten years, of death rates, it's very easy to see um, that there are so many unexplained, there's an unexplained increase, which there's no other way to explain it. And since it's all over the U.S., and you look at it by region, it confirmed that he was correct, because the highest increase in death rates, up to 9 or 10 percent, uh, was in the, the mountain region, which is basically the west, slope of the Rocky Mountains, which extend up into Canada and down into Mexico, but I'm only talking about U.S. data, and that would have high rates of rain out and snow out of the fresh Fukushima fission products that come across the Pacific Ocean, and that was very, very interesting. Um, the West Coast also had high radiation rates measured, and they certainly had increases in, in deaths 
but it was only maybe three and a half or four or five percent. Uh, the mountain region was at least double. And I just want to make sure that people understand that distance from a nuclear accident does not protect you. It's the weather, how much rain and snowfall you have, and it's the geography, whether it's uh, flat or mountainous regions that determine how much radiation ends up in the environment. So we are talking about a very, very complex issue, and each time there's a new nuclear technology introduced uh, or a new nuclear disaster, we learn more. Unfortunately, a lot of people die and even more are hurt. So we're going to see increasing death rates. We're going to see a very large increase in chronic illnesses. And guess who is licking their chops with a napkin around their neck, sitting at the table to pig out on the public? The healthcare industry. Yes, and the bankers and uh, I like to travel around a lot in local areas or, or flying across the U.S. I pick up newspapers in every airport or whatever. I gather data everywhere I can. And the I went up to Sebastopol, which is an apple, apple orchard and uh, grape vineyard area, region of Northern California in the wine country. And I was completely shocked at a city council meeting that I attended, the topic for the evening before the, the city council was a petition or a, an application for permits to build on a, a, an empty uh, car lot, and Chase Bank bought it. That's J.P. Morgan, one of the big, big, big New York banking firms. And uh, I was so shocked when they said, and we want to build a CVS pharmacy right next to the bank. And right away, I knew that the bankers own the pharmaceutical companies, the drugstores now, because I've been watching major changes over the last five or ten years in drugstores. And some of the chains have been bought out. CVS is one of the really big new ones. And when you go into these new drugstores, they have no uh, iodine um, ointment on the shelves. They have no uh, zinc oxide on the shelves. That's what you, know, you put on to prevent a sunburn or uh, people going outside, uh, uh, like athletes, put it under their eyes. And... Um, I just started wondering why those were taken off the shelf. So I went into a pharmacy, and they were happy to order it for me. But these are like $3.5 a tube, and they're essential to family health. And they would be even more essential now since we're going to have an epidemic of chronic illnesses. Since we're not getting the oversight that's really needed, for people to understand the amount of contamination and where it's occurring. People can be advocates for their own health and take it upon themselves to determine where they're most at risk and how to avoid it in their daily life because anyone who studied this disaster knows that there's no way to turn it off. This is something that is continuous until new technology is invented and in the meantime there's things that we could be doing to avoid exposure, especially for children, starting with precipitation. And since you are an atmospheric fallout expert, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about that process, the difference between rain and snow, how this stuff moves around in our atmosphere, and what is still contributing to fallout from atmospheric testing. When um, these metals burn that are produced as fission products, uranium is not a fission product, 
but it does fission and produce the fission product. These are at, at extremely high temperatures. When uranium burns, it gets up to over 5,000 degrees centigrade, which is hotter than the sun. And all that energy that it releases breaks the molecular bonds uh, that hold the mole molecules and atoms together and makes tinier and tinier particles so that basically it produces huge amounts of nanoparticles of the most dangerous, poisonous, radioactive dust that exists on this planet. And these tiny, tiny nanoparticles are highly charged. And because they're very highly charged, they float around the air and in air masses. They're transported all around the, the planet in atmospheric dust. And in the air masses, these tiny particles collect moisture. There's moisture in the air. And so the, the moisture collects or condenses on these tiny particles until they're a drop of rain. And then they fall out of the atmosphere onto the ground with that nuclear uh, particle in the, in the center of the raindrop. And when you have a lot of rain, um, it's very efficient at removing uh, a large amount of the radiation, the, these particles, from the atmosphere. And because the particles are wetted, the surface is wet by the moisture collecting on it, when these particles land on the ground on rocks or soil or plant material or buildings, what it, cars, whatever they land on, they stick with that film of water on the surface of the particle. And there's absolutely no way to clean it off. You cannot wash it off. You can't scrub it off. And it's because the uh, electrical forces, they're called van der Waal forces of attraction between the particle and the surface it lands on uh, are so strong. Uh, other forces that we would use to remove them um, aren't strong enough. So that's good. It removes the particles from the atmosphere, but it's landing on our skin, landing in our hair. Our clothes are contaminated, our umbrellas, our shoes, our raincoats, our, uh, the outside of our cars, and then we track it into the house and we contaminate our own living environment. So it's very, very important if you go out in the rain that you leave your rain gear, your rain boots, your hats, everything, gloves outside. Do not bring them into your house and don't wear your shoes inside if you've worn them outside in the rain. In fact, in the 1950s, or yeah, 1950s, President Eisenhower was in the White House. It was pouring rain that day in Washington, D.C. And um, he announced to his staff or whoever was there that, that he was going outside to go somewhere. And um, there were military experts there, and they said, no, you're not going outside today. He said, why not? And they said, well, they're they're doing nuclear weapons tests in Nevada today, and uh, the atmosphere is, and the rain is completely contaminated. You're not going outside today. They know this is happening, but they're not telling us. Now, the difference between rain and how it scavenges nuclear particles and the snow is quite different, and snowflakes are, have sharp edges and very, very sharp tips and pointy areas. And because of that, those edges and tips have very high charges, higher than the nanoparticles floating around in the atmosphere. And so they are the most efficient scavenger of nuclear materials. And snow removes 95% of the radiation in the air. It's very, very efficient. And so even uh, avoiding rain is a must, but avoiding snow is uh, absolutely, absolutely critical. And that's why the death rates on the west slope of the Rocky Mountains 
uh, was almost ten, a 10% 10 increase by Christmas after Fukushima, just eight months later, uh, then the coastal um, and the, the, the west coast, it, those death rates were lower, which is surprising because you would think the opposite. But there wasn't as much precipitation and no snowfall, um, at least along the coastline in most of California. California turned out to not be such a bad place to be. Uh, but Oregon and Northern California and Washington State, uh, British Columbia, um, they really did have very high doses. It was measured and reported by the EPA until they stopped measuring and reporting. But uh, Dr. Chris Busby, who's a British uh, low-level radiation expert for the British government and the European Union, he warned me very early on. He said, all of these agencies and all of these governments are lying. And what we discovered finally is that the only good data was being reported by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Monitoring Station. And these are not government funded or controlled or anything. They're private monitoring stations that are privately funded all over the world. And they produced the best data. And um, they had great maps with the plumes coming across the Pacific. And you could see how they were. the plumes were being guided. Cold, dense air. Uh, basically, um, is a, it's all fluid dynamics, just like water. And um, so they just steered those plumes into selected regions and cities for their depopulation um, agenda. And I was just, uh, I, I was aghast when I was watching it. And I was asking other scientists, did you see what they were doing? They were heating using a harp beam over uh, the executive and the commercial centers of uh, Canada and the U.S. In other words, Toronto and Ottawa. Ottawa is the um, administra administrative, the government center of Canada. Toronto is the commercial center. New York City and Washington, D.C. and the U.S. And so they just put uh, big warm bubbles over those cities and that cold, dense air from Japan, the plumes loaded with radiation, just flowed right around those high pressure areas. Loren, I've had a lot of reports from people, particularly in the Pacific Northwest and along the East Coast around Washington, D.C. and the Virginias, that there's been a lot of low-flying military helicopters. And sometimes it's reported ahead of time that they're conducting background radiation level research, but if it weren't for Fukushima, shouldn't those levels have been unchanged for decades? It seems like they're looking for something specific. Oh, um, I know all about that. First of all, I worked in two nuclear weapons labs, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is where the Manhattan Project started. I was working there in the 70s and as a staff scientist and handling uh, radioactive materials. And at the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear Weapons Lab, which is where HARP was secretly developed under the cover of the Cold War. And the partner, the secret partner developing HARP was the Soviet Union. So I was trained to um, handle nuclear materials and so forth and so on at Livermore. and. The, um, there's constant monitoring all over the world. I mean, they, they know, one scientist told me they know every, where every atom of radioactive material is on this planet. And these big black helicopters would come in and land at Livermore. This is at the end of the 80s and, and the 90s. And they had been taking samples out over the Pacific. Uh, of course, they were monitoring for uh, illegal nuclear weapons testing. About a couple of months ago, I heard these helicopters overhead here in Berkeley. And I started looking all over the internet to see why they were flying, because it was obvious they were here for a week and they were flying on a grid pattern. 
and um, that's an awfully expensive uh, project uh, to put helicopters in the air all day for day after day. And they were also at a certain altitude, about 300 feet, I believe. Well, it came out in a couple of local newspapers that it was the Department of Energy or the military, probably the Department of Energy because they came out of Las Vegas, um, that they were doing a radiation survey from the coastal city of Pacifica, which is south of San Francisco, across San Francisco, across San Francisco Bay, and over the city of Berkeley and the Berkeley Hills. I knew right away they were doing a transit from the coastline to the foothills of the coast ranges and that it was to measure radiation because I also saw vehicles with air monitors on top of the, um, on top of the vehicles. I've seen them before. And they were driving through all their neighborhoods while the helicopters were overhead. And then it came out later that they were, um, they admitted they were doing a radiation survey. So I, of course, knew it was to measure the radiation from Fukushima. And uh, then not just a few months ago, um, I think it was after Christmas, they were doing the same survey over Washington, D.C. These are military Department of Energy surveys to um, get a baseline basically for the radiation levels. And um, this is a horrible thing to say, but we're not any different from the Iraqis, the Afghanis, the Lebanese, uh, the poor people in Gaza. Uh, they are uh, measuring, they're dropping nuclear materials on these populations, and then they're measuring the levels the information from Iraq uh, was directly uh, called in every day to Dick Cheney's office when he was vice president. And I realized when I studied all that data for Iraq that they were determining how much more they had to bomb them to get a certain radiation contamination level to reached a certain kill rate that they had uh, predetermined. So that's really what they're doing in the U.S. And, and all over the world. The U.N. no doubt is involved too. They were doing it during the nuclear bomb test. They're doing, they've done it with the nuclear power plant. So it's, um, it's basically to, to determine a kill rate or, or a contamination level, how much it needs to be increased to achieve their kill rate agenda.